Well, thank you, Pastor Jack Hibbs, for that little introduction. You're listening to Understanding the Times. Thank you for joining me. And as many of you know, we deal with church issues on this program frequently. We hear from people who are looking for a new church. They're debating whether they should leave their present church. They're asking how to approach the leadership of their church to consider certain topics. They're asking what are the essentials when it comes to selecting a new church. And some of you have spent 20 and even 30 years in a church and you have watched it change. Perhaps it has gone woke, but what does that mean? Who heard of woke even 10 years ago? No one. What does seeker sensitive mean? And I can give you a quick answer to that. 30 years ago, the church growth movement suggested that churches cave to the culture, that they implement programs and even theologies that made people comfortable in the church, and that gospel preaching change accordingly. Much of Christendom was swept into that. After all, when leaders like Bill Hybels and Rick Warren suggest this, that was good enough for a lot of pastors. Joining me in studio for the hour is Pastor Mark Henry from Revived Church, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, northwest suburb of Minneapolis. We hold our bi-monthly Understanding the Times meetings there. We just had one a few weeks ago with Tom Hughes. We live stream these to the world, and I have asked Pastor Mark to address some of these church-related issues. He has a passion for the church and has been a pastor well over 30 years. His church was a part of a denomination until recently, and now it is more independent, I would say. Mark, welcome back into the studio. Jan, thanks for having me. It's great to be back. I gave that little introduction, so why don't I ask you some questions? Again, listeners, they fit into these categories I just talked about. What are some essentials? Folks are looking and visiting and asking questions, and we can start with some core elements of Christianity that they need to be looking for, asking about, looking at a website of a new church, important things, salvation, trinity, scripture alone, Jesus alone, faith alone, heaven and hell are real. Jan, when you think about theology, I always tell people to think in three circles. Circle number one, absolutely essential, the core of Christianity. In the old days, we used to call it the five fundamentals of the faith, the authority of scripture. Number two, the deity of Jesus Christ. Number three, the incarnation, in other words, the virgin birth, and that he becomes flesh, the hypostatic union, fully God, fully man. Substitutionary death on the cross, he dies as a substitute for us, taking the wrath of God, and bodily resurrection and then justification by faith. So that's the core. And then the next circle is orthodoxy. What Christians who have believed that core believe about the Holy Spirit, what they believed about the Trinity, what they believed about the church, what they believed about eschatology in the sense of the coming of Christ, that Jesus is coming, the fact that there's a real heaven, a real hell, that there really is a resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous. And then the third circle is distinctives. And in those distinctives, You and I are pre-trib, pre-mill, and I tell people the more those circles unite, the greater our level of fellowship that we can have with other people. And that's really what we're talking about in a church family. How do we have the greatest level of fellowship? You start aligning those three, and you're going to have the greatest level of koinonia, fellowship with one another. There are some, I don't want to call them secondary issues, but some would call them secondary. In other words, I could not go to a church That is replacement theology. The church is the new Israel. Now, maybe it's a very solid church in other ways. I could name some that are very solid, but they do believe in replacement theology. Obviously, that then twists most of the Bible. So their solidness just went out the window because the church is hardly Israel. To me, that's not a secondary issue. When you think about those circles, when I trusted Jesus, I didn't even know that there was a distinction between yeah. church and Israel. I'm just yeah. too ignorant. So as those circles get bigger, your theology becomes more and more refined. Now, Jara and I would never want to be a part of a church, invest a lot in a church. I would never be on staff. I would not have my staff members, again, at this really important level of koinonia that the church is supposed to be if they weren't pre-millennial. Because once you say that the church replaces Israel, there's a whole series of things that end up happening. You jettison of the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, all these things start being affected and it's massive. That's my point. It's trickle down until everything seems to be corrupted. They may be preaching salvation in that church though. They may be even giving altar calls and many are getting saved. And that's true in history. For Mm -hmm. example, Spurgeon was a great Baptist preacher. And he was historic pre-mill. So he did recognize the distinction between the church and Israel, although not like a dispensationalist would today. 
And some people will say, well, this dispensational movement is all new. That is not totally true. This is even an illustration of it. But what we do know in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 4, God tells Daniel to seal up the things that are in the book until the last days. Friends, God sealed them up. And in these last days, when people are moving to and fro throughout the earth very rapidly, and it says knowledge will increase. Think about the increase in knowledge in these last days. Think about what's happening there. It says in those last days, these things are going to come to light. That's what we're able to see now. And so Christians are able to see with greater clarity these prophetic passages than ever before. Yeah. What about six-day creation? Where does that fit in? When you start talking about eschatology, the only way you end up being pre-mill and pre-trib is if you have a literal, historical, grammatical yeah. interpretation of Scripture. There's three areas when I look at a church or I look at a ministry. What do they say about Genesis 1 through 11? If they believe in a literal, historical, grammatical interpretation like you and I do, they're going to believe in six literal days. That's what the Scripture says. It's consistent all through Scripture. What that church teaches about people in ministry, specifically 1 Timothy chapter 3, yeah. and, and then in eschatology. If you have a literal, historical, grammatical interpretation, those will be consistent. And here's something I've noticed, Jan. When you look back in history, those who have an allegorical interpretation to whether it's Genesis 6, 1 Timothy 3, or the book of Revelation, anybody that allegorizes them, they are going to be more susceptible to a social gospel. In other words, they're going to abandon eventually the gospel, the core. Or in our case, they're going to embrace wokeism because they're going to allegorize the rest of the Bible. And that's exactly what we're seeing today. And let's say the church is in agreement with 80% of what we've just outlined here. We've hit a lot of bullet points. Should someone stay and fight over 10%, 20%? Some will just give up and walk away. Some want to stay, and maybe fight is an inappropriate word, but let's say have discussions with the church leadership about implementing some topics. How about implementing the importance of Israel into a format that is pretty much ignored? How much do you fight for something like this? First, you got to realize that the church is not a parachurch organization. Mm -hmm. Parachurch organizations are new in church history, and parachurch organizations focus on specific issues that the Bible talks about. For example, my friends over at Answers in Genesis, they focus on Genesis 1 through 11. My friends that focus on the family, they only focus on the family. But the church has to deal with Genesis 1 all the way to Revelation 22. That's the problem with the whole seeker-sensitive movement. Originally, they were saying, tear everything down to just the gospel. Only thing that people need is the gospel. That's not true if you're a church. That's what parachurch organizations do. Because what did Jesus say? Go and preach the gospel to everyone baptize them in my name, and then teach them to observe all that I've commanded. Not some, but all that he had commanded. The church uniquely has to deal with all of the Bible. That's what pastors got to do. And so when churches aren't doing that, then what I want to say to my pastor friends is rise to the occasion. The head of the church, Jesus Christ, who loves the church, who died for the church, who's purifying the church, who's coming for the church, who will deliver the church, who's going to hold the church accountable for their doctrine and what they tolerate, says, teach the whole counsel of Scripture. And that is what some are going to leadership and asking, and they're blown off. Some are asked to leave because they simply want the whole Bible preached from Genesis to Revelation. Some are not getting treated very nicely at all. My question is, how long do they put up the fight? Every individual is going to be at different levels because all these churches are different levels. But I want you to keep in mind this, that I have pastors who are in trouble right now. One called me the other day weeping. He said, can I meet you for lunch? And there are people in his church who have embraced this woke agenda, just as Jack mentioned, and their denomination is moving that way, and he's being attacked, and he's being run out of the church. So it goes two directions, Jan. Right. There's good pastors who are under attack for trying to teach the Bible. There's great people in the church who have churches that are going woke. And so this is what I always tell them, is historically, those who have been in churches that have allegorized different areas of theology, and then they move farther and farther away, there's a point of no return. I can't give you an exact spot for everyone. That would be impossible. But what I can tell you is this. We need to stay long enough so that we warn people. Okay. This book, the book of books, Genesis 1 through 11, all the way through Revelation 22 is important. It's all God's word. Jesus said none of it would pass away. And that's what we're going to follow. And I'm going to follow it. I'm begging you to follow it. And then if not, come out from among them and be separate. Okay. That is the struggle some are having as we speak, and I'm hoping that we can give them some direction in our discussion this particular hour. Some have given up. Some have walked out of their church. They tried to make a difference. They tried to 
implement some kind of change, ask for some kind of change, and I mean topics, including creation, including the Lord's return, including the importance of Israel, and were blown off or politely told that's just not our calling. So they've left, they're wandering around, and they simply don't know where to land. That's why I'm asking what would be important for them to look for when they land. We're talking a little bit here about the seeker-sensitive. Let me just play a short clip. Here we've got Jeff Kinley. He's talking to Nathan Jones and Tim Moore, Christ and Prophecy TV. And I think Jeff here outlines the frustration of then landing. You can go from the frying pan into the fire because then they land in a secret church. They may have left a church that was preaching the gospel, but was leaving out key topics and go into a secret church and you got bigger problems. Within the church itself, I mean, the title of our program today, Apostasy in the Church, how big a problem is this? I mean, is it an individual Christian problem or is it a corporate problem where churches are drifting and at an accelerating rate, would you say, in today's day and age? No, I agree. I, I think it's more of a, of a corporate thing, more of a global thing, actually, uh, because people in churches are really opting for expediency. Because what's happened is we, we've seen a huge decrease in church attendance, specifically in America. So that sends many pastors into panic mode saying, we've got to do whatever it takes to get people into this building. Instead of going out and being salt and light, what the Bible tells us to do, yeah. because there's not a single verse in the Bible that tells a non-Christian to come to church, but there are lots of verses yes. that tell Christians to go out into the world. We've got it backwards. We think that there's an event that we put on on Sunday mornings. We've got to make it so exciting, so entertaining, so interesting that we'll get people drawn in. So what's happened is, is we've, as you said in the, in the beginning, we begin to compromise some of the values and scriptural truths that we see in the Bible, those doctrinal truths in order for the expediency of getting people in the building. Well, I've wow. noticed too in church services when, when just as I got older and I realized that we've shifted from being Bible-based and faith-based mm -hmm. to being what they call seeker-sensitive. And right. I mean, we're all seeking unbelievers to come yeah. to Christ, but it's like we turned our church service as a equipping, edifying, and sending organization right. to send Christians out. So let's go to a 101 level, invite non-believers in and hope they get saved, and yeah. it rarely ever happens. And it seems like since we've adopted the seeker-sensitive movement, we've drifted away from mainstream Christianity. Would you agree? I would agree. And, and let's be honest, we love technology. We use technology. Yeah. It's a great tool. Uh, but as one pastor recently said, many churches today are nothing more than a light and rock show followed by a TED Talk. It's something really to just motivate people for their daily life kind of thing, when the Bible is much deeper than that. The Bible equips us. It gives us everything we need for life and for godliness, Peter wrote. And pastors are opting for entertainment more instead of equipping the saints for the work of service. And what's the result of that? We're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. This happened some 25 years ago, 30 years ago, Seeker Movement which is when, same time, our favorite topic, the new music came into the church. I know some folks who simply quit going to church just because they could not accept the new music. So this happened somewhere in the 90s is when I track it. Your thoughts? Jan, what Jeff said there is really important because the seeker-sensitive movement was based on a presupposition. The presupposition is that everything is about the gospel. And it's true, life mm -hmm. begins with the gospel. But you can't allegorize the rest of Scripture, because if you allegorize the rest of Scripture, eventually you're going to allegorize the gospel. That's exactly what's happened. The gospel is core, but it goes from the gospel to discipleship, which means following Jesus, keeping his commands. And you know, when you think back to Jesus holding the seven churches accountable in the book of Revelation, Thyatira was confronted for tolerating Jezebel and her immorality. Now, that means you got to understand who Jezebel was in the Old Testament. She was an immoral, godless queen. And she led Israel with her husband Ahab into all sorts of immorality. And Jesus is saying, your churches are tolerating that. Listen, the seeker-sensitive churches, because they allegorize the rest of the Bible, are rapidly moving that direction. And we're seeing it today. They're apologizing for our moral standards. They're apologizing for the Bible. They're saying, detach from the Old Testament. Now they're right. telling us to detach from the whole Bible. It's the slippery slope to abandoning God and becoming apostate. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have in studio with me Pastor Mark Henry, Revived Church, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. We hold our bi-monthly Understanding the Times meetings at Pastor Mark's church. Give the address, Mark, for those who are in the Minnesota area. 7849 West Broadway in Brooklyn Park. You've gone to four services. Why don't you give the time, and I'm going to reference the music. We have four services on the weekend. We have a Saturday night at 4 o'clock, and then we have an 8 o'clock service. We have a 9.30 service, and we have an 11 o'clock service. 
And your traditional music is Sunday at 8 and 9.30. And folks, there's nothing like it around. It's fantastic. You'd love it if you came at 8 or 9.30. Mark, you have referenced taking things literally, allegorizing, etc. And the churches that do that, and I use this term on air a lot, they're called amillennial. They allegorize all of Revelation. They allegorize all sorts of things that they shouldn't. And a church that is amillennial, I'm going to offend some people here, can never possibly understand the times because our times today, Bible prophecy is exploding on the scene out there in the world, and people are trying to understand it. If you're going to allegorize things that are going on, you'll never understand what's happening in our world. And I think that's what people are reacting to in some cases. Absolutely. I've got friends who are going to be in heaven. They love Jesus, yeah, of course, right? Of course. And they're all mill or post mill, and they get mad at me. But I say, why don't you come to Israel with me? Let's see what God has there done. There you go. And you know what they say to me, Jan? Why would I go there? The church is spiritual Israel. We've got more land than God promised Abraham. We've got more spiritual influence. And they just go on and on. I'm going, you're missing the point. For 2,000 years, the people have been gone from the land of Israel. Came God back. is bringing them back. Mm -hmm. This is a miracle right before our eyes that only God could do. A ancient people with the Hebrew language brought back yep. to a specific piece of property because God's got a plan for ethnic Israel in the future. Bad theology has consequences. You'll never understand the times. You'll never understand the Middle East. You'll never understand God's plan for Israel. Never, if you're going to be a part of this stream of theology. Jesus said, the truth shall set you free. free. And that's true in the gospel, but it's also true in everything else it says in the scripture. That's why I keep saying over and over in scripture, do not be deceived. Satan is the great liar. There's only two kingdoms. And God has a plan for ethnic Israel. We are the benefactors in the church age. It's called the time of the Gentiles when you read the exactly. book of Revelation, but it's for a time. And then he's going to deal with Israel, keep his promises to Israel. The time of Jacob's trouble will come. Then he's going to create a new heavens and new earth. Friends, Peter says, we are looking for a new time when God creates a new heavens, new earth after the millennial kingdom in the mm -hmm. eternal state. That's ultimately where we're headed. You'll never understand the times if you're a part of a kingdom now dominion church. In other words, a stream of theology that teaches that the church will make eventually the world totally perfect. Then Jesus Christ can come back. That's just another thing you want to avoid, folks. That's why we're bringing it up. You might want to avoid the amillennial. You can find this information out usually on a website of the church. You can certainly find it out by asking a pastor or an elder or a deacon if this is what they believe. And if they say these things, you might want to move on to another option in your town or town down the road. Post-millennial, latter rain, again, you'll never understand the times. Post-millennial, Jesus is coming back at the end of the millennium. You don't want to go there. Again, Mark, we can debate whether folks should stay in a church that is preaching post-trib. Some folks are staying and just putting up with it, but then they're being taught that they're going to meet the Antichrist, which is a terrible false assumption. Not happening, ever. No, this is so important. We're living in the times of the Gentiles. What does it say in the New Testament for the church age, the church people? We are anxiously awaiting for the imminent return of Jesus Christ. It can happen any second. If you're a post-millennialist, bless your hearts, my friends out there that are listening, you actually, according to Jesus, you need to be looking for the Antichrist and the abomination of desolation. Right. That is not what we're commanded to do. Israel is commanded to look for the abomination of That's desolation right. because ethnic Israel is going to be going through that tribulation for those who haven't believed in Christ. I was just in Israel, Jan. I was mm -hmm. just begging some of my Jewish friends, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Redeemer of Israel. He is the Promised One. Escape the wrath that is to come. Thank believe you, in the Mark. Lord Jesus. These are some things, folks, we hope that will give you a little guideline as you're looking for a church, thinking about leaving a church. If you do leave, you got to start the search all over again. We want you to understand the times. We really do. But there are some theologies and some streams of thought here that will never happen in some churches. We need to consider wokeness for a minute, Mark. I want to play one more clip here because a woke church is going to be emphasizing things like critical race theory, social justice. LGBTQ, heavily the social gospel. But this is a little clip of four pastors. Happens to be Brian McLaren, Greg Boyd, Brian Zahn, and a pastor by the name of Bruxy, I believe he's from Canada, who are apologizing to the gay community. My name is Brian McLaren. I'm a former pastor. I'm an activist, a blogger, an author. My name is Greg Boyd. I'm a teaching pastor at Wilden Hills Church in Maplewood, Minnesota. Hello, I'm Brian Zond 
pastor of Word of Life Church in St. Joseph, Missouri. I'm also an outspoken ally for LGBTQ people. I'm a straight Christian, and on behalf of the straight Christian church, I want to ask forgiveness from the GLBTQ community. And I want to apologize to the gay community for the treatment that you will often receive at the hands of people who profess to be followers of Jesus. Hi, I'm Bruxy, and I want to apologize to members of the LGBTQ community. Throughout history, and yet to this day, straight Christians have judged you, we've excluded you, we've persecuted you, we've scapegoated you, all because you're different from us. The worst way, the most demonic way that we achieve unity is we pool together our own anxiety and fear and rage and project it upon some nefarious them. It's called scapegoating and it is demonic. And too often it has been gay people that have received that kind of hatred. The queer community has, over the years, been so horribly stereotyped by conservative Christians. The Christian church has been until very recently a universally hostile environment for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer people. Even to this day, a lot of straight Christians put the blame for social problems on the GLBTQ community. The reasons for this are complicated and sad, but it involves with the same kind of misuse and misinterpretation and misapplication of the Bible that led to the discrimination against women, led to anti-Semitism, but it expressed itself for all of history up until now in homophobia. I want you to know that insofar as straight Christians have acted and continue to act that way, they are acting in complete contradiction to what Jesus stood for. You know, Jesus never sided with the Pharisees and scapegoating certain people groups and judging them. In fact, he rebuked the Pharisees for their self-righteousness. Mark, let's go back five years and ten years. People never heard of this term woke. Two, three years ago, folks actually took a sabbatical from church that churches were closed. They came back eight, ten months later, and everything from the pulpit was woke. Can you help us understand that? And we're going to pick up on this in part two of my program because we're coming to a break here. But help us understand what we just heard, because again, what came from the woke pulpits, critical race theory, social justice, LGBTQ, apologies to everybody. Jan, what we just heard was the apology for the morality of the Bible, but that was before COVID. Then we come back after the pandemic and we've taken it to a whole nother level. Right. Now we inserted race. We've made this a race issue, morality as a race issue. So let me just go back and unpack a couple of those things. Number one is this, when they apologize for saying homosexuality is immoral and that God hates sin and that Jesus died for sin, that's wrong. That's demonic. Now, let me just also say this. Everybody has evil desires. Why? Because all of us are sinful. Male, female, doesn't matter our skin tone, doesn't matter our hair color, doesn't matter our eye color. We're all sinners. All of us have evil desires. Every one of your evil desires, whether it's a heterosexual desire or a homosexual desire, all of that is sin. Jesus died on the cross to pay for that sin. Let me just quote to you a verse and notice how this verse starts. 1 Corinthians 6, do not be deceived. That means Satan is out there trying to deceive you, trying to deceive me. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminates, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor coveters, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but now you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified. How? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the Spirit of God. And then verse 18 says, flee immorality. Those pastors are sinning. Jesus is going to hold them accountable yeah. because they're scratching out that sin. All of those sins Christians should stand against. Jesus died, and that's what we need to do is be pointing people, rather than rationalizing, apologizing, saying, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross to pay for that sin. I want to remind you that there is a church that has a church locator on its website, Pastor Brandon Holthouse, Rock Harbor Church in Bakersfield, California. You hear him on this program many times, and you can go to rockharborchurch.net rockharborchurch.net and look for the church locator on his website and they have selected several hundred churches that they feel are relatively sound. Remember, his team can't visit these several hundred churches and spend six weeks there examining everything. So cut him a little bit of slack. 
if they don't get every single one exactly right. I'm coming back in a couple of minutes. I'm going to continue on with Pastor Mark Henry. You can reach Pastor Mark at revivebrooklynpark.org, revivebrooklynpark.org, or markhenryministries.com. Again, I partner with him for our bi-monthly Understanding the Times, where we've done almost two years coming up this summer of every other month meetings, have a wonderful experience, and have live-streamed the events to hundreds of thousands of people who I think are rather grateful for all that we've shared over the last couple of years. Mark, thank you for all you and your team does. Jan, we love you. Thanks for partnering with us and helping us advance the cause of the gospel and trying to strengthen the hands of our friends in these last days. Back in a couple of minutes, folks, don't go away. So many churches are checked out. They have no clue what's happening. And when the most prophetic events that are converging, most of the church is sleeping. They're, I, I call them uh, the, the zombies, Christian zombies. I mean, night of the living dead, so to speak. They're, they're, they're saved. They got their, their fire insurance, but man, they are Laodicean out. They are clueless, indifferent, apathetic, and asleep. And it's so frustrating sometimes as the remnant, the Philadelphia element, sees all of this. Sometimes what we say falls on deaf ears, man. But um, there is a remnant that listens, that hears, as wanting to know what in the world's going on because all the things point to the sign that the soon return of the Messiah for his church is coming soon. Welcome back. Brandon Holthouse, he's a little passionate there too. He feels as I do, and that is the state of the modern church is really troubling. So we're talking about that this hour. I have Pastor Mark Henry in studio with me. And let me just say real quickly, because there's a lot of confusion on our YouTube channel. And the confusion goes on due to the hijackers. They have stolen hundreds and hundreds of our videos on YouTube. They are pretending to be olive tree, but they are scammers. The easy way to discern is look for our currently 189,000 subscribers, and that is always going up, so in a few weeks it'll be more. The fraudsters have a few hundred subscribers. If you see that, run! Again, 189,000 subscribers or more. That is our legitimate channel. It's best to watch our videos on our website, on Rumble, and our radio videos are also on his channel, Christian TV, on One Place's Light Source as well. Just be careful on YouTube and know there are hundreds of stolen videos. They're going to have false information. They're going to be after your money. That's why we keep sending this alert to you. Mark Henry, we can't leave this woke situation. I said it a few minutes ago. Folks, in church 10 years ago, this term didn't exist. Five years ago, I don't think it existed. The pandemic came along, churches shut down, folks went back, and it was woke. And they're trying to understand it's heavily critical race, social justice, LGBTQ. It's compromise, compromise. You wanted to add to what we were discussing. I think it's really important that people understand. So the secret sensitive movement moved us to allegorizing the rest of the Bible except for the gospel. And then that group, many of them started to allegorize the morality of God, apologizing for taking a statement out of the Bible on sexuality. And did you know that every time false teachers are mentioned that move us towards idolatry is always immorality involved? Jan, it's consistent all through the New Testament. Warning, false teachers will always have licentious, godless immorality. Now, coming back from the pandemic, because that allegorizing was mm -hmm. already taking place, I had people saying, Mark, we've been attending this church for 22 years. We came back and all of a sudden the pastor says we're going to be pursuing social justice Mark, we used to have Bible studies, and now we're having a study, yeah. and it's called White Fragility. And I'm not making this up, Jan. There's all these books out there that are written by secular people who have never read the Scriptures, who don't believe in God, who don't believe in Christ, who don't believe in a Bible, like Robin D'Angelo mm -hmm. and her famous book now, White Fragility, and it's used in evangelical churches everywhere. So instead of studying Romans or First Thessalonians or the book of Daniel, we're studying this. And you say, so what is woke? It's an ideology. It's a way of thinking and processing that's rooted in Marxism, that there's systems that are set up that are always oppressing somebody else. So someone's always the oppressor, someone's always the oppressee, and we got to identify them and we got to destroy those systems. How has that worked out now? Well, it's worked out in the area of race, but it's been worked out over the last several years, conflict between men and women, conflict between parents and children, then in economics and now in race. When you think about what is it to be woke, this is the easiest way to describe it. If somebody says, 
that people should not be held responsible for their individual actions, they're woke. If they don't believe in a meritocracy, in other words, you should work hard to get an A, you should work hard to win at something. If they say that's bad or white oppression, that's what wokeness is. If you say the nuclear family is white oppression, that's wokeness. If you say that mathematics is white oppression, that's wokeness. If you say the Protestant work ethic, in other words, you should do your work heartily unto the Lord, Colossians 3, is white oppression, that is wokeness. And we're seeing it on all areas of life. How did this happen? This might have been unknown in the pulpit three years ago. Then came the pandemic, and then the shutdowns, and then we came back, and everything changed. How is that possible? Because Jan has been filtering down through, we've been moving away from a literal historical grammatical okay. interpretation, and this is the natural outcome. Let me give you an illustration. We've got a great young lady in our church, goes to a university that historically has been influential and a evangelical beacon in training people that have gone around the world. This was right after the pandemic, was sitting in a class, the professor is saying, you all need to apologize for the oppression that the whiteness has created in America. And we need to realize that the Bible does not condemn immorality or homosexuality like you've been taught. And this is what the professor said. There's no Hebrew word for homosexuality, therefore the Old Testament doesn't talk about it. This young lady raised her hand, Jan, and said, excuse me, doesn't God talk about this with Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis? Mm -hmm. Doesn't God talk about this in the book of Leviticus? And she quoted for him what it says in the book of Leviticus 2013. Mm -hmm. It may not use the word homosexual, but this is what it says. If there is a man who lies with a male as one lies with a woman, both of them have committed a detestable act. And it goes on and says, they shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltness is upon themselves. Now, that was true also for kidnapping. That was also true for committing adultery. This isn't the only sin, but this professor who had been allegorizing the Bible has allegorized the morality of the Bible and insulted God. And then you take it to the next level. It's not surprising that we've ended up there. And I think Christians should not be surprised because we've actually been warned by the Holy Spirit. Titus chapter 1 talks about how important it is for good and godly pastors. Why? For there are many rebellious men and empty talkers and deceivers and how they have gone out into the world. It says in verse 16, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Or in Acts chapter 20, the Holy Spirit records Paul's last words to the elders at Miletus. He says, guard yourself and your flock, among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, leaders, and shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. He says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves, yes. Jan, these are savage wolves. Yes. After my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Christian friends, these are savage yeah. wolves. If you've got a good pastor, I'm begging you, love them, encourage them, care for them, because he's being attacked at levels you don't even know about. And we need to help pastors during these days. We're not the accusers of the brethren. Jan, I know you're not accusing yeah. the church. We love the church. Jesus died for the church. He Amen. loves the church. That's why I'm excited about what you and I have been talking about with the pastor's huddle. I'm going to go there in just one second, but I want to put a little PS here. And that is, did this wokeness blossom a little bit more after the George Floyd situation in Minneapolis? We're a half an hour from where that happened. So we're allegorizing the rest of the Bible except the gospel. That's what the seeker sensitive did. And then those same evangelicals or many of them started allegorizing the rest of the morality of the Bible. Then we had the shutdown and then Mr. Floyd's tragic death. And then we come back and there's like, we've already departed from the Bible. So what are they going to talk about? So they pick up these various woke books. Mm -hmm. And now this is what they preach rather than the Bible. Listen, when you start abandoning the Bible in various portions, whether it's Genesis or Revelation, you start abandoning those portions and you narrow it down, narrow it down. Eventually you're going to leave the whole book. And that's what they've done, Jan. They preach everything else i.e. someone like Robin D'Angelo instead of Jesus. Preach yeah. Jesus. Preach the Word of God. We had an understanding of the times a few weeks ago with your good friend, Tom Hughes, pastor of 412 Church in California, and we had a wonderful evening. I want to play a short clip from that evening, and I want to talk about it for a few minutes, and then we're going to bring up the pastor's huddle that we've decided to assemble here in the coming weeks and months. Tom, that night, we were all over the map as a concern signs of the times that are exploding everywhere. And I think we talked about maybe even 10 different signs of the times. In this particular clip, we're beginning our on-the-platform panel discussion with Tom, 
I start out the discussion, and then, folks, we enter into a short discussion, and then I want to come back and talk about what we talked about, because I hope we raise an issue here. Can we make America great again? Is there time to make America great again? I'd say there might not be. Everything's out of sync. I'm going back to your message. Everything, black is white, up is down, good is evil. Everything's twisted. Everything is completely, um, as I said, out of sync. So, but we've got a whole segment right now, I'll just leave it to, to America, who think we're going to, to make America great again. And if so, that's, that's, that's great, that's fine. But I don't think we have time to turn all, this ship all the way around Make, I, I think Jesus is coming any day, and we don't have time to make America. I want your, t- I want your perspective. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there's a couple of different things that are at play here. One of them is I don't, I look at America, I don't, I don't have hope for America. I have America's Coming Judgment as one yeah. of my books, yeah, yeah. books, and that was six years ago. Now I think it's came. Um, but at the same time, we don't know what God's going to do. And I'm hoping that things turn around. I don't really hope for the sake of America so much because I think that's kind of selfish in, in American eyes. Is I, I hope that there are a whole lot of people that come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, before the rapture. I do know that it will happen after the rapture because I can read yes. the book of Revelation. We know a great work is going to be done of salvation of souls after the rapture. I look at things right now, and, and I look at the Bible, what does Jesus say, and what does the New Testament say? Jesus says, will I find faith, uh, talking about the, the last days. Uh, but then when you look at the New Testament writings of the Apostle Paul, what do you have? You have doctrine of demons. The, the whole state of things, it's, uh, it's a, in the last days, perilous times will come. People have form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Uh, also, in, in going on, Paul says... Uh, deceivers, uh, men will be deceiving and be deceived, uh, be deceived and deceiving. What you have painted in the picture, I give you a lot more verses. Second Peter chapter three. In the last days, scoffers will come, say, "Where's the promise of his coming?" Our our dads used to tell us Jesus was coming again. What I see is what Jan sees. Also, um, I hope, but I don't. I mean, God could do a miraculous thing. Uh, people are talking about a. Re- revivals breaking out. I, I have challenges with what I'm seeing on that, but that's another story. I don't want to get too many angry emails. <laughs> but hey, if, if, but God could do a miracle. God could do incredible things between now and Friday that we aren't aware of. But biblically, it appears as we get closer and closer, you'll have fake Christian things happening. That's what it really appears. A lot of things that are claimed to be of the Lord, a turning of America. I have a lot of friends that believe America is going to get turned around and have one last great hope. I think there's a political movement that is so strong on both the right and the left that what's happening is people are putting their their faith more in the politicians than they are in Jesus. Yes. Can I, do you have, do you have yes. one more minute for one example? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, yeah. And I might be wrong on this, but I think I'm right. So, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, because I know you. Um, when Jesus was crucified, when he came, right? He, the, so you have the Sanhedrin that votes to have him crucified. Who's part of the Sanhedrin? The left and the right. You have Sadducees and Pharisees that made it up. Well, the problem was that Jesus wasn't the Messiah they wanted. Uh, what the Pharisees really wanted was, we got to overthrow Rome. We need to fix our, it, we need to fix Israel. The same dynamic is happening right now. It's the left and the right, and there's a whole lot of people on the right that don't want Jesus. They want America fixed. Right. And, right. and so I think we could experience some kind of fake revivals, even in the political realm. But it's, it, listen, if, it ain't, if it's not Jesus of the Bible, if there isn't repentance, if there isn't right. genuine surrender and turn to Christ, I, I don't know. I just see... I, that's the way I see it. Okay. Well, let's just, let's just say it this way. You could have some really good laws come down, and we could have, you know, a jettison of some of the insanity and energy or some of these other areas that Tom talked about, but you don't have salvation if those things happen, right? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. It doesn't say um, change your energy policy, go back, you know, to uh, right. 
the realization that you need you know, fossil fuels and you shall be saved. And so you can have good laws, but that doesn't mean... Listen, this is really important. Government was created by God to suppress evil and to give praise to those who do right. When Satan's in control of government, he will flip that. But good government never saved anybody. Only thing it does is suppresses evil so people can live in a sane society and have that blessing. But government can't save us. So, so important. Thank you, Tom, for sharing that. That was just a short clip of what we did that night for almost two hours. We titled it, Is This the Final Push? In other words, the final push to the new world order, to a new form of banking that's on the horizon to just a new way of doing life, perhaps run by the globalists. And I think, Mark Henry, we that night saw America as a sinking ship, maybe too late to turn it around, maybe not. We don't know what's in the mind of God. Now we've got a banking crisis on the horizon, and we brought up that night that the banking crisis is likely leading to central bank digital currency. Your thoughts here? Jan, there's 11 sectors in the U.S. economy, and you see it in the S&P 500, and all of those 11 sectors are being affected by the ideology of wokeness. That's why we're seeing all of the policies that we're seeing. That's why we're seeing the destruction, the unraveling of the American economy, the unraveling of society all around us. You and I have said over and over again, I hope we've said it clear enough, of course we want America to be blessed. We want Australia to be blessed. We want Canada to be blessed. We want blessing. But here's the deal. When a nation shakes their fist at God, embraces immorality, celebrates wickedness rather than righteousness, and talks about justice and then flips justice upside down, it will not have God's blessing. It cannot prosper, and it will be undone. If you just think about the very core, we've already said one of the key elements of wokeness is the absence of a meritocracy. In other words, If you believe you should be rewarded for doing good, that's white suppression. Mm -hmm. Well, if you apply that to these 11 sectors, you're dismantling movement forward. If you say analytical thinking is white suppression and you apply that in science and communication and so forth, you dismantle all of these things. What we really need is people to turn to the Lord, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Will they do it in the last days? The Bible says there's going to be great apostasy. And that was one of the points Tom was bringing out. Folks, you can watch this presentation. It's on our Rumble channel. It's on our YouTube channel. It's at MarkHenryMinistries.com. It's at OliveTreeViews.org. And go to video. You can get a DVD for just $10. No shipping in the U.S. or Canada. $10 video of almost two hours of a lot of information. Call my office. Go to my online store, OliveTreeViews. Views as in viewpoint, OliveTreeViews.org. I think the point that night, Mark Henry, was we're trending towards the tribulation. I say that a lot here. Tom brought out some rock-solid facts. What we're experiencing in the church, and we've been talking about it almost an hour, it's a doctrine of demons. We're finding no sound doctrine. We're finding a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. We're finding deception is the key phenomenon going on today. We're finding scoffers. Doesn't sound like a very spiritually productive time, but at the same time, We're finding a remnant of believers that love the Lord with all their heart, that want to get the gospel out while there's time, that want to go to a church that is getting the gospel out while there is time, and that want to go to a church that is telling the truth and is finding it harder and harder to do. That's the point of this hour. And it shouldn't surprise us that it's like this. God told us it's not going to trend up. It's going to trend down Mm -hmm. in the last days. Jan, you know, when I trusted Jesus back in 1979, and I'm reading through the Bible, I'm just a student, and I'm saying... Wow, I don't see America in biblical prophecy. Right. America's not in Ezekiel. America's not in Daniel. America's not in the book of Revelation. How can these things unfold in a literal way if America is the world's superpower and we're not in the Bible? Can't. It can't. And so, Jan, I was like, how can our economy be destroyed? We are watching the systematic destruction of our economy based in a false ideology of wokeness where they're celebrating around us and we're becoming from a superpower to a middle power. Why? Because that had to happen so that the Antichrist can come out of Europe. Like my good friend Jan always says, things are falling into place. <laughs> okay. We had a wonderful discussion and a Q&A that night. Again, our next meeting like this, folks, will be Thursday evening, May 11th, with Bill Koenig. Just a couple of questions. They were submitted that night. I'm going to throw a couple of them at you. And one of the questions is, in light of what we talked about with Pastor Tom Hughes and in this particular hour today— How do we best occupy until Jesus comes in the current times we live in, which, again, things are chaotic. 
things are upside down, things are backwards, and everything good is being called evil. How do we occupy until Jesus comes? That is so critical because we're being driven to chase all sorts of rabbit trails, and some of them are better rabbit trails than others. Listen, friends, there are four specific things that the New Testament, the Bible, tells us to do as we anticipate the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Number one is we need to keep the commandments. I read that that night. First Timothy chapter six, it says, I charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of Jesus Christ. So that's number one, obey the scriptures. If you do that, you're being successful. You're occupying the way you should. Secondly, if you're a spiritual leader, you're a pastor and you can hear my voice or you need to encourage your pastor, listen to this. It says in second Timothy chapter four, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus and by his appearing and his kingdom, you preach the word. And then it talks about loving his appearing. Listen to this, 2 Timothy chapter 4. I've fought the good fight, I've run the course, I've kept the faith. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will award me on that day. But not only me, but all those who love his appearing. So keep his commandments, preach the word, be in a place where the word of God is being shared, where you're sharing it with others. Then love his appearing. And lastly, we wait for him. In other words, we're looking for Jesus. Listen to these words. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. Those are the things that people are apologizing for in the church. Really? No, we're supposed to deny those things and to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing. So we're looking for the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I always tell people this, if you're going to occupy well, number one, keep the commandments. Number two, preach the word of God. In other words, you go out, you share the word of God. Your pastor should share the word of God. Thirdly, love his appearing. And then number four, wait for his appearing. I'm waiting for you, Jesus. You're my rescuer, not a political party, Amen. but Jesus. You have instituted a pastor's huddle, and the first meeting of this distinguished group will be May 10th, 11th, 12th. Do I have the dates right? Yeah, 10th, 11th, and 12th. So our next Understanding Times event, Jan, you and I love the church. We're not the accuser of the brethren. We love the true church. Now, there's a pseudo church. Mm-hmm. And that pseudo church, Jesus will hold accountable. But we love the true church. And we love you pastors out there. We love you church leaders. We love you friends. Jan, just as you and I have talked and shared about the desperate need for pastors to receive instruction in eschatology, it struck me. Right now, if you graduate from a good, and they're hard to find, but if you graduate from a good seminary, the average MDiv student, Master of Divinity student, has about seven hours of study in eschatology, and that's it out of his whole education. Seven hours total. Jan, as I shared that burden with you and I shared that reality with you, this whole pastor huddle idea came up. And so we've invited Dr. Mike Powell, great servant of God, graduate of Dallas Seminary, got his doctorate degree from Western Seminary. He's been teaching the whole council of scripture, just like we've been talking about for a long time. And he's influenced my life. So this pastor huddle, we're bringing in 25 pastors from across the country. If you're listening, you're a senior pastor, we want to invite you to come. If you're attending a church, I want to encourage you, go to your pastor and say, hey, sign up, go and be part of this. But he's going to give 10 hours of instruction on what it means to apply a dispensational hermeneutic, a literal historical grammatical interpretation to the book of Daniel and Revelation. And I believe it's going to impact churches in a great way. What's the cost? Jan, I just want to thank you for, again, not only carrying the burden, but creating the opportunity for pastors to be able to come. This is a gift from Olive Tree Ministries and Mark Henry Ministries. We're trying to do this, so there is no cost. You guys come. There is some scholarships if you need help with travel. But we would really like to see you teach the whole Council of Scripture. And this is just the first step. We'd like to get three major classes. We'll have like 30 hours where this all comes together on different key topics of studying the Scriptures. Why don't you contact Mark through MarkHenryMinistries.com? You can also do that through his church, Revive Church in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, ReviveBrooklynPark.org, and get further details from the church. I think at this point, it'd be better part of wisdom to contact Mark rather than Olive Tree. Mark, thank you for putting that together. We appreciate it. That sounds very, very exciting. Jan, we just want to strengthen the body of Christ, and this is one of the ways we can do it. I see it as a force multiplier, just like the U.S. military sends the Green Beret to train people. This is part of us as a church family. This is part of us as a ministry, strengthening the hand of the church, the body of Christ, in a bigger way. There may be some today who are listening who have been hopefully inspired, but they do not know the Lord Jesus Christ in a personal way. Let's go out of the hour and give that plan of salvation? I don't know where you're at in your spiritual journey, my friends, but what I know is this, that whatever your skin tone is, whether you're male or female, whatever your economic status, whatever your educational background, whatever country you're living in and listening to this, 
You and I desperately need Jesus Christ because we're sinners. Every one of us are sinners. And Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He came and he died on the cross to pay for sin. How do we know Jesus is the Son of God? He rose again the third day. That is the stamp. That's the manifestation of the miracle of God so that we would know that he's the Savior. And the Bible promises this, that if you will believe in him, that you'll trust in him, God will give you everlasting life. He'll forgive your sins. I just want to ask you right now, would you call upon the name of the Lord? Would you trust in Jesus as your Savior? I don't know what your sins are. I always know what my sins are and that Jesus paid for my sins. He's radically changed my life. Why don't you trust him right now? Let me just lead you in prayer. You call upon his name. Jesus, you're the son of God. I confess that. I confess that I'm sinful and that I need forgiveness and that you died on a cross to pay for sins. And the best I know how right now, I trust you. Thank you for dying on that cross for my sins. Thank you for washing away my sins. Thank you for giving me a relationship with God. Thank you for making me a child of God. I love you, Lord. I bless you. If you trusted in Jesus, do me a favor, reach out to me, reach out to Jan. We want to celebrate with you. Thank you, Mark Henry, for coming in today. I appreciate it a great deal. Again, check out the church, revivebrooklynpark.org. Services Saturday 4, Sunday 8 a.m., 9.30 and 11 a.m. I want to go out with a comment and then I'm going to do something a little different. The Bible says that Christ promised to build his church based upon Peter's confession in Christ as a son of God. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 